Today we're beginning an Advent series called Anticipating Emmanuel, and we're going to be walking through the first couple of chapters of the gospel according to Luke. If you have your Bible, you can look in Luke chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 5 and reading through verse 25. This is God's word. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us in your word, and in it you have revealed for us your great plan for our salvation. We thank you for the role that John had to play in that plan and pray this morning that you will open our eyes to see the significance of this in your great plan and that we might see and long for the coming again of Jesus, Emmanuel, our Lord and Savior. Bless Pastor Brent as he brings this word. Empower him with Give him this this spirit's presence and power to proclaim this good news to us today and give us ears to hear. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of its deep. A wind from God swept over the face of the waters. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. But through the one man, Adam, sin entered into creation, in death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. In the end, our heart was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of its depths. We have waited for a day, but there is only night for brightness, but we walk in a land of deep darkness. Emmanuel, God incarnate, let there be light. Martin Luther is the name that we most readily associate with the Protestant Reformation. 
And it's right that we should revere him as one of the great fathers, if not the most important figure of the Protestant Reformation. Indeed, it's hard to imagine the Reformation certainly taking place when it did and how it did without his writings and his work and his initiative, guided, I believe, by the Holy Spirit of God himself. And yet even Luther would admit that he was not the first would-be reformer. He may be the most famous, but he wasn't the first man who sought to bring about change in the church, who sought to address some of the corruptions that were evident in the church, that sought to bring people back to understanding that it's the word of God that guides us as individuals and as a church to know who God is and how we can live lives that are pleasing to him, what it means to be saved and how can one be saved. One such man who came before Luther was a Czech individual by the name of John Huss. And his career was approximately a century before Luther's. And this man working in Bohemia began to study the scriptures and he realized If I look at the scriptures here and I compare it to our practice in the church, I see almost no correlation between the two. So corrupt has the church become in its traditions, undisciplined, unchecked by the word of God, that it bears no resemblance at all to the faith of Jesus Christ. And so he began to call people to read the word and attempt to understand it. He translated the Bible into the Czech language. He sought to to address many of the corruptions that he saw in the Catholic Church at the time. And as you can imagine, this did not make him a popular figure among the hierarchy. He began to garner a following among the people in his country. And so he he was seen eventually as a dangerous man. His writings were declared heretical. He was condemned as a heretic and excommunicated from the church. And in 1415, when a council was held in the German city of Constance, he was summoned there to answer for his teachings. And he was actually given a papal decree of safe passage back and forth from the council. Well, this council of Constance was a tawdry affair indeed. In fact, we're told that hundreds of prostitutes were given passage into the city to entertain these supposedly celibate priests who had gathered there. And when Huss arrived, this pope, he was a real piece of work, declared that it's okay to tell lies to a heretic. And so rather than not respecting his uh, guarantee of safe passage actually had him thrown in prison. A kangaroo court was arranged and he was tried and convicted for heresy and burned at the stake as a heretic. Martin Luther, in his education as a Catholic theologian, heard about Huss, and his understanding was that Huss was a terrible heretic, fully deserving of the punishment that he got. And yet, as Luther's eyes began to open, as he began to read the scriptures, and he He compared them to the writings of Huss, which he read secretly, sort of on the side. And he began to see, wait a minute, maybe he was onto something here. Maybe he was telling us things well well in advance of this reformation that's blossoming, that nobody took heed of. And so while Huss never had an opportunity to see much of the fruit of his labors in his day, Martin Luther would, and he would come to revere Huss, and in fact, he would write a preamble to Huss's writings as they were translated into German, and he wrote this. He said, how firmly Huss clung in his writings and words to the doctrines of Christ. With what courage he struggled against the agonies of death. With what patience and humility he suffered every indignity, and with what greatness of soul he at last confronted a cruel death in defense of the truth. Doing all these things alone before an imposing assembly of the great ones of the earth, like a lamb in the midst of lions and wolves, if such a man is to be regarded as a heretic, no person under the sun can be looked upon as a true Christian. By what fruits then shall we recognize the truth if it is not manifest by those with which 
John Huss was so richly adorned. And the more he began to study the writings of Huss and he began to appreciate the, the, the way he had understood that the Bible is the supreme word of God and it, it, it trumps all of the traditions of men, many of them so corrupt that had been layered upon one another in the Catholic Church at the time, he actually began to realize, you know, the, the things that I'm teaching, I owe a great debt to Huss. He would later write this. He said, I have hitherto taught and held all of the opinions of Huss without knowing it. We are all of us Hussites without knowing it. I do not know what to think for amazement. <laughs> Many people consider themselves Lutherans or following in the Lutheran tradition, but it's really the tradition of Huss that Luther was able to popularize and to set the world on fire with reformation. And see, the fact of the matter is that Huss, though he wouldn't have no way of, of, of knowing it, was a forerunner of the great reformation that was to come. He didn't get to see the fruit of his own labors, but he would be a predecessor. He would, he would be making a way, a smooth path for the reformation that would come some one century later. Well, so it is with the man that we're gonna be focusing on, at least the his pre-birth narrative, that figure is John the Baptist, a very important and often neglected figure in scripture, but we'll be considering his role this morning as a forerunner for Christ, as somebody who's coming to make the path straight to prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ and his word and his work. So it's, I think, significant, it's interesting that Luke decides to start his narrative, his gospel narrative, uh, not with announcement of the birth of Christ, but actually with an announcement concerning the birth of John the Baptist, this forerunner of Emmanuel. So we look at Luke chapter one, and in verse five, we read this. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. You know, what I love about scripture is that it is rooted in a particular time and place. Luke's gospel more so than any. But you don't get in the Bible this sort of once upon a time in a land far, far away sort of thing. No, we're told exactly when things happen. They are rooted in history. This should give us great confidence in the reliability of the word of God. So this is situated in a particular place, Judea, Jerusalem, and in the reign of a particular king, Herod. And we're told about Zechariah and Elizabeth. We, we observe that Zechariah is a priest and his wife, Elizabeth, and, they, and we're told that they are both God worshipers, God fears, indeed blameless before God, following scrupulously all of the law and the statutes. Now, we shouldn't read into this that they are perfect. That's not what Luke is trying to communicate or that they kept the law so impeccably that they don't need a, a savior themselves. What he's simply trying to illustrate for us is that these are good people. These are people who are following after God, seeking after God. And indeed, what might be said of Elizabeth and Zechariah is that they constitute a kind of remnant within Israel of that day. As we'll see during the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Christ, the whole religious system in that day was pretty badly corrupted. You didn't find many religious leaders who really understood, much less practiced, what was in the law. They certainly didn't understand the very spirit of the law that God had given them. So it was a low point in biblical history. It had been 400 years since the last Old Testament prophets had been plying their trade and, and, and things had fallen into disrepair. There hadn't been a meaningful Jewish state in centuries as well. So this was, you might say, a low period in Jewish religious history and yet God had raised up, had maintained a remnant of men and women like Zechariah and Elizabeth who remained faithful to God. And you know, it's just like God to always maintain a remnant. Even in the worst possible circumstances, there are, there is maybe just that few, maybe only one or two 
who remain faithful to God in the midst of a wicked generation. We could go back and talk all day about this in the Old Testament. Think of Noah, for example, the one righteous man in a very wicked civilization, so bad that God saw fit to actually destroy it completely. Think about a man like Elijah, who is a prophet, who is a prophet alone up against 350 prophets of Baal. But living in a time when when you could identify 7,000 people who had not bent the knee to the false gods. God was preserving a remnant, even while Elijah was working in what it was under the most wicked king that Israel had ever known. God preserved a remnant There, Think about the experience of Daniel and his friends in Babylon. Even in the midst of exile, where many people had turned away from God, God preserved a remnant, maybe only one or two in some cases, who would stand up faithfully and even pay a price to remain faithful to God in the most difficult circumstances. Revelation talks about a remnant that will be there at the end. And might I suggest to you, we may be entering a time in our own society today when only a remnant will remain. When most people, perhaps the vast majority of people, will find the pressure too great to bend the knee to a wicked and corrupt society and its its increasingly strident demands to do so. We may be entering a time when only a small remnant will remain faithful to God, and yet God will preserve that remnant by his goodness and by his grace. Do you intend to be part of that remnant uh, brother and sister? Well, this is the kind of situation we see uh, unfolding before us here. A, A wicked and corrupt religious environment, and yet you have this one good priest, at least, Zechariah, and his faithful wife. And we're told then that that uh, in verse seven, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, does this sound like a familiar story if you know your, your Bible? This is a whole theme that runs itself throughout the Bible. We'll talk more about it in, in a minute of women who cannot have children and God miraculously undertaking for them. I think it's important to note here that this is thus a miraculous birth. In other words, this wasn't going to happen uh, physiologically. This was going to require divine intervention for them to have a child for which we're told later they had actually been fervently praying, though it seemed like that window had closed, the time had passed for the possibility of them having a child. But God is going to be faithful to them and miraculously undertake for them and allow this to happen. So verse verse eight, now while he was serving, this is Zechariah, as priest before God, when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Now, tempting though it is, I won't sit here and bore you for the next 15 minutes with all of the intricacies of how the priesthood worked and uh, what this actually meant. Let me just cut to the chase. He was chosen by Lot to have the honor of performing this service. And from what we understand, in all likelihood, based on the number of priests that existed at the time and uh, how these things went in terms of the calendar, this would have been something like a once or twice in a lifetime opportunity for him. This was not a weekly thing. So uh, chances are this may have been his one shot to perform this service in the temple. So this is a, a big day. You know, he wants to make sure his suit is well pressed, right? He wants to make sure that his breath is fresh. You know, this is a big event uh, for Zechariah. Okay, so it's it's helpful to understand the context into which uh, this this drama will unfold. So we're looking at a unique opportunity for Zechariah to perform a, a faithful priest, right? a, a good guy, perhaps in, in the small minority of good guys ready to perform his service in front of the temple. Well, then something uh, quite unexpected is going to transpire. Verse 11, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. Well, this is unfortunate timing, it would seem. 
He's getting ready to perform this most important function and here an angel appears. Now, I think if you're like most Americans, your understanding of angels comes more from Hollywood than it does from scripture. I hope that's not true of most of you, but maybe it is. And so in Hollywood, they've had shows about angels, right? There was one called Highway to Heaven, I seem to recall, in the 1990s. And later on in the 1990s, uh, there was another one called Touched by an Angel. Ever, ever watch any of these shows? And if you watch those or if you look at Renaissance paintings and so on, you'll often get the impression of angels as these sort of winged creatures who appear and are there to, to straighten things out, to make your life better, to bestow gifts upon you, to bring good news, and so on. But what I would challenge you to do someday, if you're, if you're ever you know, at the airport, you're waiting for your plane and you're, scroll, you're using, scrolling through your phone and so on, Look up angel in scripture and you'll find some 300 or so occasions in which angel is, angels appear. And tell me if you think it's a good idea to be touched by an angel. <laughs> about half of the time, you're, you're, you're as, let's put it this way, you're about as likely to be killed by an angel as helped by an angel in scripture. Ask the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers if they wanted to be touched by an angel. <laughs> Didn't end well for them. Now, don't get me wrong, angels do are sometimes heralds of wonderful news. Sometimes they are there to help you. Sometimes they are there to bestow gifts and so on. But other times they are harbingers of God's wrath and even the executors of his judgments. So you can understand that the appearance of an angel, far from being a, a comforting sort of thing, it can be terrifying. In many ways, you might say that Zachariah's fears are well warranted here when he sees an angel uh, in his midst. This is not, a, 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 not an unusual response. And in fact, uh, more often than not, when an angel arrives and wants to reassure people, they have to say something to the effect of, fear not, do, do not be afraid, okay, relax. Don't have a heart attack. I'm actually here to, to help you. And this is gonna be the case here. He says in verse 13, the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Whew, all right, I survived that encounter with an angel. And not only that, but he came to bring me some good news. He came to tell me that my prayers have been heard. We've been praying for a son. It's, it's far past the time when that seemed possible or likely. And here we're being told that God is going to honor our request. He's going to give us a son, the joy of our life. And we've even been told what his name is going to be. Now, this is truly a miracle. And as I mentioned a minute ago, this is consistent with what we see throughout scripture, there are approximately eight occasions in scripture where women are described as barren, unable to have a child. And in many of those cases, the Lord uh, turns things around, makes it possible for them to have a child. At least in one other case, even when that, you know, the, the window of time seemed to have passed for that to be possible. But some of the most important figures in the scriptures uh, come to us as miracles of sons who were born to women who theoretically could not have a child. Think about Isaac, think about Jacob, think about Joseph. What about Samuel? How about Samson? And here, John the Baptist. All born to women who uh, were at one point or another barren and God intervened miraculously to allow them to have a son. Perhaps the, the, the one in scripture that bears the most resemblance to this is actually the account of Samson, whose unnamed mother was, uh, was told that she would have a son and was also told that he would take, take this Nazarite vow where he wouldn't drink alcohol and so on and would be consecrated to, to God's service. We have a, a somewhat similar situation here with the announcement of the birth of, uh, the upcoming birth of John the Baptist. So we see that God miraculously undertakes to bring people into the world who will accomplish great purpose for him. And so this is a, 
a man upon whom, in, in the person of John the Baptist, a man upon whom great things will undoubtedly take place. And so we move on to verse 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So we get even more information, a a prophetic word about what the ministry of John the Baptist is going to be all about. And this is exciting stuff. His birth is gonna be an occasion for joy, we're told here. Um, He is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're told. Now, this is interesting because scholars who have studied this passage are divided on what exactly this means. It seems pretty straightforward, filled with the Holy Spirit, but they wondered, is this filling of the Holy Spirit in what you might call the Old Testament sense? And you might regard John the Baptist as the last of the Old Testament prophets, if you will. Is it in the Old Testament sense of God giving his spirit upon somebody to do great work? Or is it, should it be understood in the New Testament sense? In the sense that all of us who are in Jesus Christ are filled with the Holy Spirit as our permanent endowment, so to speak. In what sense is it? Well, I don't know. I think you could probably go either way with this. The important point is this, is that from the womb, John the Baptist is a man upon whom God has placed his spirit and who will then in the power of that spirit and in accordance with God's will accomplish wonderful things on behalf of the coming kingdom of God. Of this, we we can be quite sure. He's gonna have this Nazarite-like vow where he's not gonna drink alcohol. He's going to be singularly focused on doing the task that God has called him to do. Clearly, we see here a connection between uh, this narrative and the Old Testament prophets who told of a a second Elijah who was to come. Clearly now this is that second Elijah who is here to call people out of their wickedness, call people out of their apathy to and, and call them back to God and repentance and faith. Now the great 19th century theologian Charles Spurgeon gave a wonderful sermon on verse 17 and he said this, he said, John the Baptist is, is going to make his greatest impact as one who is going to be preparing the way, smoothing the path for Christ who is going to follow in his train. And he does this principally, Spurgeon said, in four ways. And I thought these were so uh, helpful that I wanted to share them with you this morning. First of all, he is going to prepare the way by arousing their attention, arousing the attention of the people. And we're gonna see in John's ministry, this is certainly the case. He is outside the box, isn't he? He's a little bit strange. People were captivated by him, by his lifestyle. Even the fact that he didn't drink wine in an age when everybody drank wine, that was a little bizarre, wasn't it? They said, some people said he has a demon even for being a a, a teetotaler, for dressing the way he did, for eating locusts and so on. He was an unconventional sort of guy and that caught people's attention, And so he had a bit of a following that gathered around him. And people, you know, what's this guy going to to do next? So he he did a wonderful job of capturing the attention of a people in a very staid and apathetic religious environment. He seemed alive. He was excited. He was charismatic, right? So he captured the people's attention. But that's one thing, but that's certainly not enough. What else did he do? Well, the second thing he did was he awakened their consciences, He awakened their consciences. One of the ways he did this, the primary way he did this was calling for repentance of sin, calling people to repent of their sins, and not only that, but to be baptized. Well, this is kind of strange, isn't it? What is this baptism? Well, this wasn't totally without precedent in Jewish history or theology. This didn't come completely out of nowhere. There was a a practice uh, within Judaism of baptizing, so to speak, of taking purifying, ritualistically purifying baths in a mikvah 
that would purify you, not so much or not ordinarily in reference to sin, but actually ritual purification at certain times of the month for a woman, for example, or after uh, encounters with corpses and this kind of thing. It was, it, was, it was understood that you would ritually purify yourself after certain occasions of uncleanness. It was also common, interestingly, for a person who was a convert to Judaism to take such a, a full immersion bath, essentially a baptism into the Jewish faith. So this was not totally out of, out of the, the question or something they had never had any precedent for, but for, for John to be baptizing with reference to repentance of sin and purifying oneself from sin by confession of your sin, uh, this was something new. This was something that arrested people's attention. This was something that you might say pricked their conscience and got them thinking about, in what ways have I displeased God? In what ways have I failed to live up to God's standard, okay? So this was, this was a, you might say, an awakening of the consciences of the people who surrounded John to their sin and the problem that that created. <clears throat> Thirdly, he, he prepared the way by pointing out the nature of true religion, pointing out the nature of true religion. Well, how did he do this? Well, what was the typical Jewish understanding concerning their religion? The typical understanding was, hey, I am biologically related to Abraham. And therefore, as a son or daughter of Abraham, I am part of the Jewish faith. There's no distinction to be made between ethnic Judaism and religious Judaism. They are one and the same. So I am a Jew because my mom was a Jew and my grandmother was a Jew and so on. That's what identifies me religiously. And, and yes, perhaps secondarily, trying as best you can to sort of follow the law here and there, to follow the traditions of our forefathers. Yes, that's part of what it means to be in the faith as well. John, however, would strongly challenge this view of religion. And that's what made him both popular and unpopular, depending on who you, you talk to. So for example, he would say this in one of his sermons in, in Matthew chapter three, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. He's saying, don't rest on your laurels as somebody who is in the biological line of Abraham. That doesn't make you a follower of Christ, nor to simply blindly try to follow the law. What is the fruit of repentance in your life? Right? Have you actually repented of your sins? And is there work that flows out of that repentance that demonstrates the faith that you have embraced, the faith that you have in God. That's where real, that's the essence of real religion John is trying to explain to them. But of course, many of them would have none of it while some did follow. And then finally, the fourth thing that John did was to declare the grace and power of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, good, it's, good, it's a good thing to get their attention, to awaken their conscience, to explore true religion with them, but the bottom line is declaring the grace and power of Jesus Christ. John would say this about Jesus as, as sort, of, sort of passing the baton, as it were, of ministry to him. This was he, Jesus, of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have, received, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. So what John does is he, he prepares people to understand that it's not through your religiosity, much less through your ethnicity. Even repentance is only the beginning. It's Jesus Christ who has come to free us ultimately from the tyranny of the law that we can never uphold and to allow us to be reconciled to God. So the law came through Moses and that was a wonderful thing. In many ways that helped prepare us, but grace is coming to us in Jesus Christ, in his words, and most importantly, in his work, what he is going to do for us. So he pointed people, you see, quite clearly to Jesus Christ. So those are four ways in which John the Baptist in his ministry helped to prepare the way for Christ. And let me suggest to you today that this is a wonderful model for how we share the gospel with people in our role as evangelists, in our role, dare I say, as Christ's forerunners. This is how we 
can do that as well. You see, we capture people's attention. Perhaps we live life in a different way. Perhaps the words that come out of our mouth are different. And this is intriguing. This is interesting. This person fascinates me. They're not like the rest of the world. And perhaps in the things we say or as we have a chance to have conversations with people, their conscience is awakened as they see the fruit of a redeemed life. What is the lifestyle of a person who has been forgiven much, who understands the grace of Jesus Christ? And perhaps their consciences will be pricked over time. What is it that they have that I don't understand? Perhaps as you have an opportunity to get into more conversation, you're able to expose what true religion is all about. It's not about attempting to, to, to follow all the rules more and more scrupulously and, and, and doubling down on every religious duty, but understanding what, what's the role of repentance and reaching out to God in faith, confessing that, yes, your law is perfect, but I cannot follow it. <laughs> Save me, please. And then at that occasion, declaring to them the power of the grace of Jesus Christ, that only, this can, only the grace of Jesus Christ can save. Only through Jesus Christ can we be reconciled to God. Only through Jesus Christ can we have eternal hope. Let me suggest to you that's a wonderful pattern for evangelism. I wonder, is there anybody in your life today who you are working with in this fashion? Is there a neighbor, a family member, a coworker, somebody who, just like John the Baptist, you are capturing their attention. You're awakening their conscience. Maybe you're having discussions about the nature of true religion. Maybe you have or will have the opportunity to share with them the grace of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in your life who you're progressing down that path with? My other question is this. If you're here with us today, perhaps you were even brought here by a friend. Is it possible that God is working with you in this way? Perhaps he's got your attention. Maybe the person who brought you here you're here because there's something different about them. Maybe your conscience has been troubled a little bit as you reflect on your own life and, and there's, there's a restlessness there. Perhaps you reflected and sought resources for understanding what true religion is about and yet those have all failed you. Well, I'm here today to tell you that the solution is found in the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And maybe today is the appointed day. Maybe today is that day when you will understand that the, the, the scriptures will be open to you. Your mind and your heart will be open. You'll understand the gospel as you never have before and you will throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus Christ and find in him a worthy savior, one who can give you a hope and a future. I hope there might be one or two here this morning of whom that can be said. Well, so we see that, that, that John the Baptist was an important forerunner for Jesus Christ. He was smoothing the way, preparing the way. And you know, John is a really intriguing figure. It's, he's one of these guys I wish we knew more about. I wish we had more information uh, about him. But a couple observations about his ministry are this. You know, he was wildly popular among a certain segment of the population. And some people did not readily transfer their allegiance from John the Baptist to Jesus. We only know of a couple of, of, of concrete examples of men who were followers of John who then became followers of Jesus. There were some who were so attached to John as a religious figure that, that they continued to revere him as almost a messianic type figure, though that's not who he came to be. His ministry was largely misunderstood and yet was wildly popular. He was a charismatic person. People, you might say that when their ministries overlapped, John the Baptist was more famous than Jesus. And not only that, though John was, his ministry was confined mostly to people of Israel, his, his message went far beyond Israel. We find these this very, curious, very curious accounts in the book of Acts where the apostle Paul will find people from Alexandria in Egypt or Ephesus in Turkey who had known the baptism of John the Baptist and yet knew almost nothing of Christ. John the Baptist had such a following that, that it even carried on into post post-Christian times. You might be curious to know that while Jesus is considered a prophet in three religions, John the Baptist is considered a prophet in at least six 
religions around the world. There's even one religion called the Mendeans that still exists today who regard John the Baptist as their final and foremost prophet and have almost no place for Jesus in their theology whatsoever. They have some 100,000 followers still today in Iraq and Iran. John the Baptist was a significant figure. He even is within the Islamic religion. He is considered a great saint of the faith. And if I was to uh, tell you, because he's perhaps the most significant figure who, who died within the Christian tradition, the search for relics of John the Baptist takes on an almost Indiana Jones-esque uh, sort of intrigue. There are three churches and one mosque in the world today that claim to possess the head of John the Baptist, and you can go and visit that, that skull. There was even one church in medieval times, which you're not gonna believe this, claimed to have two heads of John the Baptist, his head as an adult and his head as a child by, the, by some miracle of, of God. That's how significant the search for relics of John the Baptist has proven to be. Blood has been shed trying to find a bone or a a skull or some sort of uh, uh, relic from the life of John the Baptist. So he's really an intriguing uh, figure in his own right. And yet much of the sort of mythology that has surrounded him later has been been puffed up and is clearly uh, not in accord with the scriptures. But he's a truly fascinating figure. And Uh, Jesus will give him his due. In fact, Jesus will lavish upon John the Baptist the highest praise you can imagine. He says this in Matthew chapter 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Wow, that's high praise from Jesus. Among those born of women, which means every human, (laughs) there there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, what on earth does that mean, right? John, the greatest man who's ever lived. And yet, anybody who's part of the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does that mean? For those of us who are in Christ, we're part of the kingdom of heaven. Are we greater than John the Baptist? Well, in one very important sense, yes, we are. You see, John the Baptist, as the last of the Old Testament prophets, though he was paving the way for Christ, You see, he never got to see the risen Christ, did he? John the Baptist preached the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he never had a chance to personally experience what that is like. John preached from the word of God, and yet he never got to see the complete scriptures. He never got to hold them in his hand as we do today. So while John the Baptist was a great man, because we are part of the kingdom of God, because we have seen the risen Christ, We have advantages that he cannot dream of. So in one very important sense, yes, even the least of us in the kingdom of heaven has things that John would have dreamt to see and never had the opportunity to see. You see, John the Baptist was a forerunner for Jesus Christ. And so he was making the path straight. He was uh, bringing to, to the people something that they had never heard before. And so as a result, he was this second Elijah. In fact, some people have mistakenly thought he was literally the same Elijah come back again because you remember, Elijah's one of only two or three people who never died, right? So some people have said, this is John the Baptist, is is literally Elijah come again. But he didn't claim that for himself. He came to make straight the path for Jesus. And you know, for us, We have advantages because we are in Christ and because we are part of his kingdom. We can do things that John the Baptist could not do. So we have the word of God before us that we can read and that we can share. We have the Holy Spirit as our our permanent companion and guide and comforter. John the Baptist, his ministry was confined to Israel. We've been given the great commission to take the message of Jesus Christ all over the world to places like Afghanistan and Pakistan and everywhere else. We've been given this great commission that John knew nothing of. And if you are in Christ, you have beheld the risen Savior, something that John the Baptist never lived to see. How great are our advantages for those of us who are in Christ? And what are we doing with those advantages that we have? 
We know, as I mentioned at the beginning, John Huss was a great forerunner of the Protestant Reformation that changed the world. He wrote a letter on the eve of his execution as he was contemplating, knowing that he was gonna be burned at the stake if he didn't, at the last minute, recant his teachings, recant his fidelity to Christ. And he wrote these words in a letter to a friend I wanted to share with you. He said, O divine Jesus, draw us nigh unto thee, Weak as we are, for if thou dost not draw us nigh unto thee, we cannot follow thee. Fortify my spirit that it may become strong and resolute. The flesh is weak, but thy grace protect, assist, and save us. For without thee, we can do nothing and are, above all, incapable of facing on thy account a cruel death. Give me a determined mind, an intrepid heart, a pure faith, a perfect charity that I may be enabled to lay down my life for thee with patience and joy. And then he writes a P.S. P.S. Written in prison and in irons on the eve of the festival of St. John the Baptist, who was decapitated for having risen up against the corruption of the wicked. Two Johns called by God to be forerunners to confront a wicked and corrupt generation, to stand on the sure foundation of the word of God, to proclaim hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Some evidence of the fact that there's a price to be paid for fidelity to Christ and his word. And I wonder as we, as we come into this Advent season and we're, we're captivated by a baby in a manger, and, and it's, it's good that, that we are, But it's also important to reflect on as Christ came into the world to suffer for us, we are also called as his forerunners, as those who take the message out ourselves, that we're called to suffer for him as well. Is this a price, brothers and sisters, that we're willing to pay so that others may know the truth? Would you pray with me this morning that God would guide us? Heavenly Father, We thank you for the work and ministry and life of John the Baptist, this important forerunner for you. We we recognize that he was not a perfect man. He had his doubts. He had his insecurities. He had his moments even of faithlessness. And yet, by your Holy Spirit, you used him in a powerful way. And Lord, as as we think about that announcement that we discussed today, to Zachariah and Elizabeth, what joy was brought into their life. And we think about a man like Zachariah who, because of his doubt, couldn't even speak, couldn't even utter a word. Lord, would we be speechless before you as we consider your grace and mercy, how awesome you are as God? Lord, would you help us as we reflect on the words of scripture, would they prick our conscience as well as we reflect on what kind of life would you have us to lead? What kind of commission have you given us to embrace? Lord, help us to be those who would be faithful forerunners for you in an increasingly wicked and corrupt generation, willing to pay whatever price you have for us to pay. Fortify us for this by your word and spirit, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.